Hi. So, at some point in your life, you've probably seen this equation, because it's become the most famous equation in modern physics. And not for entirely bad reasons. And, well, it is at least mostly true. But, like a lot of things, when you really get into it, it doesn't quite tell you everything. And I was watching somebody else's video recently, uh, Angela Collier, I think. Um, you know, small channel, so nobody can accuse me of just constantly responding to, uh, you know, large channels to uh, hop on the uh, analytics train. I just state things that are accurate as best I can when I see gaps. <laughs> and so... Um, she made an hour-long video explaining why this is only sort of true, and this is what's actually true. And she was quite correct. But the irony was that in the course of doing that, she said something that I hear all the time that's also not true. Which is that... <laughs> okay. It is in some sense true, but this is in some sense true. Right. And what she said is that nuclear fusion and nuclear fission, so, you know, nuclear reactions generally, involve turning mass into energy, and by E equals mc squared, they release a bunch of energy. Which, again, is some, in some sense true, just like in some sense E equals mc squared, but really, E naught equals mc squared, and E squared really what's actually always true, right? This equation down here is always true. E squared is equal to m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c to the fourth, right? What's all What's all this? Well, you might notice that if you just get rid of this part here, it's just, you know, E equals mc squared squared, you know, E squared. If E is just equal to mc squared, then E squared is, well, take m, also square it. You know, c squared squared is just c to the fourth. Okay. Um, well, you know... <laughs> You can reduce that just down to E equals mc squared, but really it's, you know, E naught equals mc squared. The energy of an object that is not moving is equal to mc squared, but really you have to also include the energy from the momentum. Okay, so then what about this business about, like, you know, turning mass into energy using nuclear reactions? Well, it's not quite right. It's... Let me tell you the things that are true. After a nuclear reaction has taken place, an exothermic nuclear reaction, I should say, has taken place, the daughter nuclei, whether they're fused or fissioned, will have a lower mass than the original parent nucleus or nuclei. Okay, that's what's true. Now... It's also true that energy is released when that happens. The thing that's misleading is that she's leaving out the fact that any time any reaction releases energy, the mass will change, right? A chemical reaction, too. If you take, you know, two chemical reactants and you take their masses and you put them into a reaction and then you let the energy out in the form of heat, and then you measure the mass of the resulting chemical products, you will get a lower mass. So what's so different about nuclear reactions? Nothing, okay. <laughs> except the scale, right? When you have a chemical reaction, you can release a fair amount of energy, but it's, n right, E equals mc squared, and so that also implies that, you know, m is equal to E over c squared, right? So the amount of energy being released in a chemical reaction gets divided by the speed of light squared, which is a huge number. And as a result, you can, like, there's just no way you could measure the mass difference. It's, it's for all intents and purposes, impossible. I mean, in principle, it's possible, but to develop an instrument precise enough would be very challenging, although it could be done, um, especially for, you know, chemical reactions involving a lot more energy. 
or involving a lot of energy. But nuclear nuclear reactions, the amount of energy released per uh, you know per atom involved or per nucleus involved is so much bigger that you can actually measure the mass difference after the reaction has taken place. And so later on in the video, she actually says the thing that's correct, which is if you take some object like this rock and you add energy to it, like let's say you heat it up like this, it will actually weigh more. But the amount of extra mass is so small that there's no practical way to measure it, even if in principle, if you found a way to measure the mass that precisely, you would notice that now that it's a little bit hotter, it actually does weigh a little bit more. So, okay, well, that's that minor misconception sort of resolved, but then you might be saying, okay, that's still a little confusing, and I'm going to try to get through as much of the confusion right now as I can. But I'm going to try to limit myself to not going on for too long here. Oh, <laughs> cat friend just walked in here. So what her video was all about was how people say that as an object gets closer and closer to the speed of light, its mass increases. And she keeps saying over and over again, there's just one mass. There is no difference between the rest mass and the, uh, you know, mass of an object moving at some high speed, right? There's just one mass, the mass, the rest mass, and she's right. But then that begs the question, why, why do people talk about this idea of a not constant mass? It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of funky, right? And she said that it's justified in terms of, you know, it's easier to teach. And that's true. Um, because there's another very famous physics equation that relativity sort of breaks. And I want to explain as much as I can within the time that I'm allotting myself here the ways in which it, relativity breaks it. And it's Newton's famous F equals M at times A, right? So if I take some object like this rock here and I start pushing it faster and faster and faster and faster, right? Initially, this equation is perfectly fine and good because initially me and the, let's, you know, I should say if I start accelerating this rock from being at rest relative to me, right? Because the whole thing about relativity is, you know, velocities and positions are relative. So me and the rock start off just, you know, at rest with this brick to, to each other. The rock is not moving relative to me. It's just sitting here. And then I start pushing on the rock, pushing, pushing, pushing. You know, I'm not going to throw it out the window right now, but... <laughs> nope. Hello. Here. Say hello to cat, friend. Cat does not understand relativity. Um, so, but... What happens is, as it gets closer and closer to the speed of light it gets harder and harder to accelerate, right? And you can never accelerate it past the speed of light relative to you. Or if I'm trying to push down, I can never accelerate it. I can, no matter how hard I push on this rock, it will never be traveling faster than the speed of light relative to me. And as it gets closer and closer to the speed of light, if I keep pushing, you know, just as hard as I was when it started out accelerating, I'll get sort of less and less bang for my buck and it'll get harder and harder and harder to accelerate. And so, they'll often justify when they're teaching relativity this idea of non-constant mass by saying that, you know, the mass increases and so, you know, therefore F equals MA is still true. It's just that the mass is going up so, you know, the same force will result in less acceleration. Uh, and that's not really true, right? It's, it's a way to recover the simple form of F equals MA but it's not really the right idea. And I'm kind of on the fence, actually, about whether... I, I'm not sure I 100% agree with her that it's completely erroneous to teach this to students, but it is definitely the wrong idea in the long term for your physics education. Because it turns out that, well, if you know, acceleration is how much is your velocity changing, you know, in a given amount of time, right? And, well, in relativity, t 
time is relative and velocity is relative, so acceleration is not going to be the same in different reference frames. And so, therefore, you can fix that one of two ways. You can either say the mass is not constant, or you can also say the force is different in different reference frames. And it turns out force is different in different reference frames, but that's pretty complicated to understand. <laughs> uh, and so they usually just don't bother explaining it. Um, so yeah, it, I'm not sure that it's a such a terrible stopgap, but I think she has a point that we shouldn't we shouldn't teach students answers that are quite so false like that. But at the same time, she got the same thing wrong, <laughs> right? She said that if you, she said that, there everybody's like, she said the correct thing and then she said, you know, correct thing and the incorrect thing. She said correctly, you know, if I, you know, heat up this rock, you know, it's gonna be harder to accelerate because it weighs more now, even though it's starting out you know, even starting out at rest relative to me, it's going to be harder to accelerate if it's hotter because it'll have more energy and therefore more mass. And that is correct, and she says that. But then again, she says this thing that's just not true about how nuclear processes are unique in releasing energy from mass when really it's the other way around. It's that mass and energy are the same thing. All mass is, right? It's, again, it's, th and she, this is what she says that's right. It's this equation down here. E equals, E squared equals M squared C to the fourth plus P squared C squared. That's what's always true, right? And all mass is, is, is how much energy an object has when it is not moving divided by the speed of light squared. So anytime you add energy to a system, it gets more massive. Anytime you remove energy from a system, it gets less massive. So this thing about fusion and fission turning mass into energy is, it's even worse than I said earlier, because there's an, a, an even deeper sense in which it's not true, is that the mass decrease actually doesn't happen until the energy has been radiated away, right? Because initially, the, the what, right, all you're doing when you, you have a fission or a fusion event is you're turning potential energy into kinetic energy. And if that kinetic energy stays in the, you know, uh, daughter nuclei or in the daughter nucleus, if it's a fusion, it, it, it the mass doesn't decrease, right? Because it ju just, just said, right, if something gets hotter, it gets more massive. So if something gets hotter because of fusion or fission, well, it went from one sort of internal energy to another sort of internal energy, it's still at rest, its mass has not changed. The mass only goes down when it radiates the energy away. Right? So again, this is what's true. This is what's true. <laughs> and she just kept iterating over and over again, there's only one mass, there's only one mass. And then she said this thing that completely undermines that. <laughs> so... My goal is not to, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I don't want to, 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 to simply spend all my time making corrections to, to, to other people's subtle misconceptions. Um, but this was specifically an hour-long thing about correcting a subtle misconception that people have from physics education. <laughs> and, it, and it itself had a misconception that's at the core of that. But she said the right thing. There's just one mass. But all that mass is, all that mass is, is it's set set P equals to zero. And then, whoop, there you go. <laughs> right? And it, it, there, there's something there at the end where she talks about, again, correctly about the fact that, you know, so there's this thing that even, it goes even deeper, right? That most of the mass in a nucleus is not the bare mass of the quarks. Uh, and she states this correctly. She just says that it makes her philosophically uncomfortable. And uh, I can, you know, the, the, I've thought about why would this make us so uncomfortable? And uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, it, it is, uh, maybe this isn't addressing uh, what she finds philosophically unnerving about it. But so it's, it's cause you might come, you might come to the conclusion from the, 
uh, fact that it's all like the idea that like we're we're not really made out of anything, right? That because the bare mass of the quarks is almost nothing, that we're just this like you know you know this pi this very lightweight pile of particles that could go flying apart at any moment, right? And we're only you know held together by the uh, you know, by the by the binding energy, but it's actually the other way around, right? Just like these other things, it's actually just like just like how it's the other way around with mass and energy. It's it's not that you're turning mass into energy; it's that you're losing so much energy that you can actually measure the mass difference. Because any you know, mass and energy are interchangeable. All mass is is energy rest energy of some object. Uh, but the bare because the bare masses of the quarks are so low. Um, you know, it's actually the other way around. It's that the stuff we're made of is bound together so tightly that uh, we that that actually results in that that that, that energy of that binding energy uh, actually accounts for the majority of our like real mass. Uh, so I, I I don't know if it is more just a philosophically unnerving to think of the majority of our mass as not being the bare mass of the quarks um, for. You know some other reason but if it's i feel like it it's it, it comes more from that uh, that sense that oh if we're made out of these you know very lightweight particles and most of our most of our mass is just this binding energy that we could it, it leaves one with the visceral feeling that you could go fly we could just you know melt away and go flying into a million pieces at any moment uh, or you know avogadro you know avogadro's number times mass in kilograms ish uh, number of pieces uh well times several other factors um number of pieces uh it, but real in reality it's it's the we're very 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 stably held together and we're actually so stably held, held together that uh we have a, a much more measurable mass than uh you know we would otherwise uh but you know maybe that's not what's unnerving about it maybe it's just unnerving to think that uh you know uh rather than being mostly made out of point particle you know rather than mostly being uh you know most of our sort of substance coming from point particles, it actually just comes from these uh, interactions. But again, there's only one mass. And furthermore, you know, because we want to, we don't want to be no but, we want to be yes and. So yes and, this is what's always true. And all mass is, all mass ever is, is the rest energy divided by c squared. Right? You don't care where it comes from. Right, which that's what I would say because I'm a condensed matter physicist and we deal with quasi particles and composite systems all the time. And so to us, it's like we we and we, we we it's even worse than that for us. We deal with something called effective mass, but I'm not going to get into that. It has nothing to do with relativity. It's actually a, essentially a quantum mechanical thing, or it's quantum mechanical plus statistical mechanical um, thermodynamic type thing. Um. So yeah, <laughs> I. I don't think I explained that very well. Um, I'd like to go more in depth uh, at some point, um, but uh, man, I just it's it's I I I I I thought it was actually a pretty good explanation by and large of why why this is misleading, this and this is true. But at no point does she actually mention this, right? Because f equals ma is actually an approximation, right? Because accelerations are relative forces are relative, and mass is, she says correctly, not. There's only one mass, there's just, th you know, there's a reason we call it the rest mass. There is a reason to call it rest mass, though, and particle physicists do call it rest mass, and above all else, you need to understand that nuclear reactions do not turn matter into energy. They do not involve matter and antimatter annihilating one another. The, you know, lepton number and quark number are both preserved. <laughs> if you want to uh, use some technical language there. Uh, all that's happening is that you're releasing so much energy that you can actually measure the mass difference. And just like she says, there's only one mass. This is what's always true. And as a result of losing so much energy, the mass difference is actually appreciable. And so technically, every chemical reaction or every reaction, whether it's chemical or mechanical or anything, if a, if a system loses energy, it loses mass. Right. If a system or if I say if a system at, if a system in its own rest frame loses energy, it loses mass. Right. In, in any time a system loses energy that does not come from the whole thing, whole object, whatever it is moving, it loses mass. So I hope that's all clear as mud. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I was going to talk about uh, this little project I'm working on, but uh, it's uh, not quite as far along as I'd like, so I'm going to do that later. So, uh, yeah. She was right, though. There's only one mass, and this is what's true. This is what's true. E squared equals m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. If you remember nothing else, remember, you know, E equals mc squared, only true if p equals zero. What's really true? This equation. All right. Bye.